Sunday, believe it or not, I kind of mentioned this in the announcements, we're going to continue on in Acts 17, and um, let me give you some relief, um, we are covering a Palm Sunday and the account we see in the Gospels, and we'll be doing the same thing again um, next week with Easter, uh, it really worked out, I see some pretty incredible parallels uh, between where we are in Acts and where it falls on our calendars as far as having Palm Sunday and Easter. And um, there's this account of the triumphal entry. It's a wonderful portion of Scripture. And then uh, the resurrection and where we currently are in Acts. I just see some great truths that we can extract and see. And I want to present um, part of that this morning in Palm Sunday. And then also next week, of course, with the resurrection. So it's a little different um, today and next Sunday. And I'm preaching in a, a style of a form that is much, much different than I'm typically I'm not used to. Um, however, I'm very, very excited about it. And I'm very, very excited about what we talked about this morning. I've been attempting to preach through Acts 17 in a very practical, applicable way. That's been my, my desire as we go through this chapter, that we'd be able to pull out some very practical things in the life of Paul and Timothy and Silas and see evangelism and see disciple making and see preaching the good news and then apply it to our own lives. And I want to continue that this morning. And so here's been my prayer as I've been preparing uh, this message, as I've been studying this message for Palm Sunday and Easter. My prayer is that we be crushed, absolutely crushed, by the truths of Christ's entry into Jerusalem, his crucifixion, his resurrection, that those truths would cause us to see both the, ur the urgency of taking this message to the world, the urgency of God's mission, and also the nature of his mission. I want us to see both the urgency of what we're called to do, what he's working in us, and then also, of course, what that looks like, what that urgency looks like, the nature of the world that we're going into. And I think there's several factors, okay, when it comes to talking about this type of thing, and evangelism, and disciple-making, and discipleship, and to be honest, the lack of, in 2018, the world, the, the, the church, the American church, not proclaiming the Great Commission, not proclaiming the Gospels, not being on fire for getting this message out to the ends of the earth. I think there's several factors that lead to this abandonment of the Great Commission in our world today. And I think you can make several cases for why we don't see this burning passion for disciple making and discipleship here in 2018. We've already discussed the lack of boldness and courage. We've talked about seeing that in Paul. We have to have courage and content. We have to take that with us. I would argue that the overarching reason, the, the big umbrella of why this is not happening and why we're not seeing uh, this type of urgency, is we don't have passion because uh, not only do many people fail to understand disciple-making, many people in the world also don't even understand Christianity. They are essentially what to, to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, hear me, boldly say, is to mean that you are a disciple maker. They follow naturally. You cannot be a Christian and not a disciple maker, not someone who has a burning passion for making disciples and sharing the truth of God's word. The New Testament is, is that is that is completely. Uh, they're completely attached to one another. To follow Jesus is to have a mission. Is to be on a mission. To be on His mission. And it seems like today it's almost an option. It seems like today in the church it's almost like, well, if you, if you feel called, that's what we usually say. If you feel called or you feel led to tell others about Christ, then you should do it. When the, the, the Word of God shows it as an imperative, as a command. It is something that we, we know. We know we're called to do. Not a select few. Not the ones who are professionals. But each one of us are called to go and make this an urgent message for the world. And so many people operate. I don't even you know, follow Jesus. Well, I'm sure not going to make disciples for him. There's, there's something about following Christ. Following him daily. In doing that, we see this urgency to take the gospel message to the ends of the earth. And so much of this problem is having a wrong idea of what it means to carry our cross 
and to follow Christ. Now, people in the world today, they love to flock with Jesus. Still do. People do. People love to flock with Jesus when everything sounds perfectly nice. When it sounds good. When it sounds like a, one of just, a, just another option on the table of all the different world religions. When you, when you water down Jesus and make him safe, people love him. People will flock to him. But the first hint of denying ourselves, the first hint of taking up your cross and follow me, it will send people back. People are not interested in that. You can see it in all throughout the Gospels, too. People will love the miracles. When, I, when everything was, was, was going great, he looked at me and he said, if you are going to follow me, you're going to eat my flesh and you're going to drink my blood. And they said, uh, I don't know. And then they started to walk. They didn't quite get what he was saying. And then later on he even said, you can pick up your cross daily. Follow me on the way to death. This is what it means to follow Christ. It's not easy. And so this morning we're going to continue on with Paul's journey into Athens and also weave that story into Christ's journey into Jerusalem. So I'm, I'm really excited about this because we have two stories, so to speak, of a triumphal entry into a city. And we're seeing it from two vantage points. One on the side of Christ's earthly ministry in the flesh, and then the other on Christ's earth, or excuse me, yeah, Christ's earthly ministry from heaven. Both instances are Christ's earthly ministry. One is in the flesh, and one is through the Apostle Paul with Christ from heaven. Is that not a nice thought? That, that gives me a lot of a lot of hope. That gives me a lot of comfort to know that um, I mean, honestly, I guess it's going to be a whole other sermon with that line of thought, but it gives me such comfort to know that right now in 2018, Christ is still at work in his church. And Christ is still using his church. Honestly, think about this for a moment. Jesus Christ is still, we, we always say his earthly ministry, we talk about when he was in the flesh, here walking in Jerusalem, he's still doing earthly ministry. Christ is still doing the earthly ministry. All this time later, he's just doing it through the hands and feet, us, the church. There's no such thing as a heavenly ministry where he's just doing things that, no, Christ is at work in the world today, right now, this very second, through us. We've been saying this the whole time in Acts. Christ is still at work, and that's how. He hasn't stopped his earthly ministry. He's just simply stationed in heaven, so to speak, at this very moment. So get your thumbs ready with your Bibles. We're going to be in Acts. We're also going to be in the Gospel of Luke. So you're not flipping too far. It's the same author. Acts 17. Last week we finished up looking at Paul going to Berea, one of my favorite portions of Scripture. I absolutely love um, that moment of Scripture where Paul makes it to the Bereans. And this is um, after he was chased out of Thessalonica, uh, once again being threatened by the Jews and Pharisees um, that were there. And he arrives in Berea, again, he goes straight to the synagogues, goes straight to where the Jews are, and begins to preach Christ. And when he arrives in Berea, he does the exact same thing, there's a much different outcome. These, quote, noble-minded Jews, they were eager to hear the truth. They, they were thirsty for the truth. They wanted to hear the truth. So they sought out the truth, and they examined the Scripture daily. They listened to Paul's word. They didn't dismiss him immediately. They listened to everything he said. They went back to the Old Testament and said, does it line up? Does it all make sense? Is what, he's, what Paul is saying here, does it make sense? Does it line up with the truth of God? And so they examined every single day while they listened. It's just a beautiful thing. They studied to make sure that everything he said lined up. And in verses 10 through 15, we read that many Berean Jews and also many Greeks, they received this word and then they what? They believed. And so now you've got brethren. Now you've got believers. Now you have followers of Christ. Right here in Berea. But our favorite little troublemaker, as we, we like to call him Paul, we all need to be little troublemakers from time to time. Our favorite little troublemaker, Paul, he had really done a number on the Jews of Thessalonica. He had really upset them. They were not happy with what he came in and preached. And this is how you know you're a good troublemaker. He's, he's leaving. He's in Berea. And the word spreads back to Thessalonica that he's preaching in Berea. That's how you know you've done a good job. And so word gets back. And they come down to Berea. And they try to run him out. And they try to cause up a stir. And so Paul is sick packing this time. They want to cause a panic and get in trouble. And so Silas and Timothy and these new brethren, 
They put Paul on a ship and they, they send him off. Um, Paul, or excuse me, Silas and Timothy stay behind in Berea at this time, but Paul is now uh, sailing out at sea and he's brought as far as Athens. And as he arrives, he also sends a message back to Berea, a lot of back and forth, to Silas and Timothy and says, When you get this, come. Come to Athens. As soon as you can, come to Athens. Now, Athens, Greece is about 250 miles away from Berea. It's not that bad for us with cars. It's about a three-day journey if you're going to be sailing. Um, much, much longer if you're going to be walking. But it will take at least three days for Paul to get there, to arrive in, in Athens. And so in other words, he arrived, he sent word, and then he waited. He wanted to wait on, on Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible. But he was going to be waiting for at least a few days during this time. Now, Athens is a, a very unique place. I've been, I've been excited for us to get to Berea, and I've also been really excited for us to arrive in Athens here in Athens. Very, very unique place. While it was not the, it was not the major political city in the world, um, Athens was certainly one of the most cultured. Athens had it all. You artists would have enjoyed it if you enjoyed art only and not the pagan worship that goes with it. But Athens had beautiful literature, art, Poetry, philosophy, you name it, sculpting, painting, everything you found in Athens. It was the height of antiquity. It was men spending hours upon hours every single day discussing philosophy, discussing the different religions of the day, <coughs> excuse me, discussing their validity, talking about um, the latest trends, talking about new culture. Trying to be as cultured as possible. <coughs> and all this is found in this one city. If the Pharisees, if they were the religious elite, well then certainly the Athenians were the philosophical and cultural elite. They had it down pat. Hours, literally, every day, talking about the same subjects over and over and over again. Now, here's all I want to say about Acts at the moment. Paul is here in Acts. Okay? Just, 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 just plug this away and keep it stewing in the back of your mind. Paul has made his way to Athens. He's there. He's waiting for Timothy and Silas to go about doing his normal routine. He wants to go to the synagogue and preach Christ. He wants to go to where the Jews may be first and preach Christ. But for now, he's waiting. And I want you to picture this scenario. I'm a visual guy. I hope you are too. I hope you're a visual guy or girl. And so he's a visual learner. I'm a visual learner. I'm picturing Paul and he's just, he's kind of getting antsy. He's looking around. Okay, this is what I want you to be thinking about. Getting at him. Looking around at all this stuff. Looking at all this culture, all this stuff. And he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. Probably sweating the bullets at this point. And so while he's in, in waiting, he's just looking around at the idols, the relics, the painting, the pagan worship, the man-made worship. Let that picture just stir around as we continue on in our services. I'm going to skip at this point. But I want you to remember Paul and Athens. And all these seeing, and all these looking at. It. And now turn to the Gospel of Luke. Keep that in mind, Paul and Athens. And now turn to Luke 19. We're going to be in Luke 19 this morning. I'll give you a moment to get there. While you're turning it, at this point in Jesus' ministry, the time has come. It is now time. It is time for him to enter into Jerusalem and begin this process that we all know is coming. A process that we all are very familiar with. At this point in Luke, the days have arrived in which Jesus will be crucified. To be lifted high on the tree. We just, we just heard the choir sing that beautiful song about his blood being poured out in an act of love. That day is rapidly approaching at this point in Luke 19. And starting in verse 28. Luke 19, 28. I'm going to read through verse 34 of Luke 19. So here's what the Word of God says. Luke 19, starting in verse 28. When he approached Bethany near the mountain that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go to the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on, which no one has yet, no one has yet to ever sit. Untie it and bring it here. Verse 31. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away, 
found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, so its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. Now we call this moment the triumphal entry. We talk about this moment being the most triumphant entry of all entries. But how triumphal can it be when you enter the city on a donkey? It's just a donkey. It's not a big majestic horse. It's not a, a big giant creature. It's this donkey. It's just a common donkey. The only triumphant thing about Jesus going into Jerusalem is the fact that it's Jesus. It's the fact that it's the Son of God. It's the fact that it's God in the flesh coming into this city. I have always, always, always wondered how these snake oil salesmen on TV preach uh, this section of text. How on earth do they preach about needing money for a new private jet and then the next very, very next thing have Jesus coming in on a donkey? It doesn't really quite make sense to me. I'm not sure at this very, very moment, Mr. Hutchinson out in Texas is skipping right over these verses. Um, but not only is the donkey a sign of Jesus' humility, but a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. You don't have to turn there, you just listen. Zechariah 9.9 says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey, hundreds of years before. You see this prophecy come to pass. And everyone, just literally everyone there is elated to see this. You, you know what's coming. You know the reaction of the crowd. They love it. They love seeing all this. And the, there's, there's one funny part no one seems to really ask about, but I think it's a very simple uh, answer. The, the, the owners of the donkey. They just hand it over. <laughs> just go, okay, good enough for me. I think it speaks to the word that's been spreading around Jerusalem. Jesus is here, and the king is here. And so the disciples are untying the donkey, and the owners come out and say, hey, what are you doing untying that donkey? And he goes, don't worry about it. the Lord needs it. And he goes, oh, okay. That's, that's, that's the attitude now. Jesus needs it. Oh, sure, here you go. Just that simple. People are excited. The, the Messiah has, has come. The King is finally here. All the people are so very, very excited. He doesn't even need to explain any further of why they're taking the donkey. That was enough. The people had found their King. It was Jesus. It was the King they wanted. The King that they felt they deserved. Finally, the King has come. And keep reading. Just go through verses 35 through 38. And this, this kind of shows you how they respond to King Jesus. They brought it to Jesus, talking about the donkey, and they threw their coats on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching, near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord! Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And so now Jesus has this man-made, homemade saddle of their coats thrown onto this colt. It says they're even throwing their coats on the road in front of them. The Gospel of John, I believe, is the only gospel that talks about the palm branches. I believe the other three all are unanimous in saying coats. It was both, to be sure. Um, there's something really neat happening here in the Gospel of Luke. There's a, there's a symbolic act happening. Although we don't get palm branches, we get coats. And it was a way of showing submission. <coughs> Remember, these are the same people, okay? This is the same people who in days will be screaming out, crucify him. And right now, they're taking off their coats and they're laying it for the donkey to, to trample over as a sign of submission. It's the same people. It's the same group. Well, that, 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 that symbolic act basically means that this is representing me as the coat. It's saying, I'm before you. You're trampling over me. I bow before you. You didn't want to literally step in front of a donkey and get trampled, did you? So you put your coat out as a sign of saying, I bow before you. I submit to you, my king, my lord. The same people, the same group that is doing this are the ones who will ask for a fee in exchange to be given a robber 
so that Christ would have his blood shed. Do you see the fickle nature of man? When things are going well, you are getting what they want. It's so easy to, to run to Christ. But picking up your cross daily and following after him, people are not interested in that. They want the good life. They want their team. They think they've got their team. They think they've got the one who's going to bring Israel to prominence to rule the world with a sword. They think he's now here. And so they lay their coats down to say, you are the authority, King Jesus. I submit myself to you. Just imagine that for a moment. Seeing this excitement there in Jerusalem. The king has come. All the people excited for King Jesus, submitting to him. All except for our favorite group of men. Those lovely, lovely, lovely Pharisees. Verse 39. So the Pharisees and the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Interesting phrase, is it not? The stones will cry out. What does it mean? Well, there's two things. Number one is the, the traditional answer we, we all know and love. It's a little bit of a play on words. Uh, it's also harking back to the Old Testament. It means that Jesus is Lord over everything. He's Lord over all creation. All things are made by Him. And so if mankind who is made for worship does not give Him worship, then creation itself cries out in glory. This means that the, the Psalms will literally grow mouths and begin to sing, simply saying that look at all of creation and all that He does. It's a, it's, a, it's a point to His excellence. It's a point to His worthiness, it, His majesty. That the stars and the sun and the trees, you name it, all these things cry out in glory to King Jesus because he's the, the Lord over all creation. So even if we don't do our job, guess what? The rest of creation does. Have you ever thought about that for a moment too? If we don't do our job as mankind and giving glory to King Jesus, guess what? The birds in the morning, when they sing, guess what they're doing? They're exclaiming. Just being able to look at what he has made. The sun as it rises gives glory. King Jesus. And yet he desires our worship. But even if we don't give it to him, creation itself screams of his worship, of his glory. There's a second thing happening here. This phrase, the stones cry out. It's a phrase of coming judgment. It's a sign of coming judgment. Again, you have to turn there, but if you'll listen. The book of Habakkuk, if you're a note taker. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 9 through 14. Just listen to each of these words. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples. So you are sinning against yourself. Surely the soul will cry out from the wall. And the rafter will answer from the framework, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? For the earth will be filled with knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see, God was speaking judgment. Jesus in the flesh was speaking judgment through his prophet. Well, in Habakkuk, it was, it was God speaking through the, through the prophet to a group of men who had done violent, horrible things for ill gain. They were literally profiting off of bloodshed. Verse 11 says, Surely the stone will cry out from the wall. In other words, you built all that you have through violence and bloodshed. The reason you have a house, the reason you have walls, the reason you have protection. It's all because it's been bought and paid for with blood, with injustice. And so it's on your hands, you group of wicked men, and the work of your hands, all that you built, all of it, it screams out, it cries in agony. You see, Jesus is alluding to this. He's alluding back to Habakkuk, in which is saying all that you have is because of what you've done wickedly, with evil intent. Through taking life. And it's not just if, now in Luke, it's not just if the disciples will stop praising me, the rocks will cry out. It's when. When the people stop praising me, the rocks will scream 
And it says cry out. That word means scream in agony. It's not just giving worship. It's screaming. Screaming aloud. This place, this city, Jerusalem, it will cry out and scream in agony at what you will do to me. It's a phrase of coming judgment, even if they didn't quite understand it at the time. That's the meaning of that verse when Jesus says the rocks will cry out. If you need to see further proof of it, go to verse 41. We'll keep reading. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you, when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground. Listen to this. And your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You catch that in verse 44. They will level you and surround you and hit you on every side. They will level you to the ground and your children. They will not leave you one stone upon another. They will completely engulf you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You did not recognize the time that I was here with you in Jerusalem. In other words, judgment is coming. It is coming. So Jesus is saying, Jesus enters into, into Jerusalem and it says he wept. Better word is sob. Jesus did not have a few tears running. He looked at Jerusalem and he sobbed. He cried. He was heaving. He was crying so much. Looking at Jerusalem. Why? Because he was disturbed by it. He knew what Jerusalem was. He knew what Jerusalem was meant to be. And yet he was a mess. He knew what their hearts were saying. He knew that as they cried out, Our King, our King, blessed be to God. All this stuff. Putting up the coats before him. He knew their hearts said, We just want a physical king. We just want a king of the sword. We just want national importance. We just want national uh, prosperity. We just want a king to bring us back as a strong nation. And Jesus did not come to bring Israel back into strength. He came to make peace between God and mankind. It's not the king they wanted. And Jesus looks at Jerusalem and says, You're blind to me. You don't even recognize the time that I'm here. And for this, you're going to be destroyed. And they did. They were. They eventually were ransomed. It's a, it's, a, it's a heartbreak you see in Jesus. He says, one day you're going to see the actual stones cry out because if you're going to look back and you're going to know. You're going to know that you missed the king. One day that day is coming. Judgment is coming. Now I've got to hurry. You, you've heard all this. And it makes you give a new perspective to triumphal entry. You can go ahead and be turning to Acts. I've got to move very, very fast, obviously. Go to Acts 17. I'll be quick. Acts 17, starting in verse 16. Remember where we were? With Paul. Waiting, Silas and Timothy. Waiting for them to come to Acts. Verse 16 of Acts 17. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Stop just right there for a moment. Again, I love Paul so very much. For why did he disturb? He needs to be laying low, by the way. Right now, he needs to be taking a couple days for us. And what? He can't. He's pacing. He's, he's walking into Athens. And you need to imagine, you need to see this, just as Jesus came into Jerusalem, and they received him. And they loved him. They, they loved the idea of a king on that side of his ministry. Now Paul walks into Athens and he says, look it up. You can see pictures of the still, the ruins of Athens. You can see the main entrances. And as you're walking around, you're seeing gigantic walls. And you're seeing gods, false gods all around. You're seeing trinkets. You're seeing paintings. You're seeing all these things in the main entrance into Athens. And you're being surrounded by nothing but falsity. 
All you're seeing as you walk into Athens is nothing but hell, but death. Things that will kill and destroy. And so as he's going in, you're seeing another triumphant entry. I want you to understand this morning. In Jesus' earthly ministry, you saw how his entry went. And you saw how the people treated him. Following Jesus does not mean we get a red carpet. And this is the very opposite. You're walking into the pit of despair and death if you follow Christ. This is why I say most people are not going to make disciples because they don't understand Christianity. Rule number one, you are to die to follow Him. On this side of the ministry, on this side of what it means to be a great commissioned Christian, on this side of what it means to follow Christ, you two are walking into a trap. Just like Jesus. Everywhere you go. Everywhere. It is so easy to preach the watered-down gospel. Jesus loves you. Okay? <laughs> Great. I love me too. Jesus died for you. Wonderful. Why? This is, there's a cost involved in following Christ. People hear all the good news. They'll say, well, my life's going to get so much better now that I'm a Christian. Did it, it happen for Christ himself? Absolutely not. They wanted something. They had their hearts set on something. And then you saw the truth of man. You saw the heart of man. And you, you see all the teaching that Jesus has prepared his disciples for. What are they doing? This is just a strange, strange teaching to think that because you follow Christ, life gets easier and better. It does not. Think about all the warnings and all the teaching that Jesus gave his disciples. I send you out, we'll talk about this on Wednesday night, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. You are defenseless. You have nothing. A wolf gets its, its claws and its teeth on your neck as a sheep. You're finished. So, so be crafty and be shrewd. We're, we're called, we're going into darkness. We're told this in the Sermon on the Mount. You're going to have the light before you, but you're going to have to walk in the pit. And the only reason you're going to see is because you got me. I don't know about you, but that's, that's, that's tough. Everyone thinks that you become a Christian, this whole world is illuminated. Opposite for me. When I became a Christian, I saw the world for, for what it really was. I saw more darkness than ever. But boy, that focused light became so much more intense. My goodness, it became so much more focused and intense. To have Christ before us in all steps. To be promising to be with us wherever we go. Continue on to verse 17 of Acts 17. And so he was reasoning in the synagogue of the Jews and the god fearing Gentiles. In the marketplace, every day with those who happened to be present. <laughs> And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Uh, I think this is kind of funny. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others uh, seemed to, to be a proclaimer of strange deities. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time with nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So now the table's been set for Paul, okay? The table has been set. He's gone to the Areopagus. He's met the Athenian men. He's walked into darkness. He's been disturbed by the things of the world. He's been disturbed by the darkness that he sees as he enters. He's had his own triumphant entry. There is no red carpet. There are no people flocking to welcome Paul. He's walking into death. He's walking into a, down to a road that is filled with darkness. All of the people who call themselves the most cultural elite of the day, Paul sees nothing, nothing but death. And now the table has been set. What, what is it that you're, you're going to preach? By the grace of God, if we're, we're here next week, we'll see what he's about to preach. We'll get to go through that message. 
And you'll get to see how this ties in with Easter. I'll give you a little heads up. Go ahead and read the rest of this section. Go to the Sermon on Mars Hill. Read through this in preparation for next week. Because if you'll notice, and I'm going to go ahead and give my sermon away next week. If you'll notice, there are more to a certain point. And they're done. Then they're out. We get to celebrate Easter tomorrow. Well, we can't celebrate tomorrow if we want to. We're celebrating Easter next week, next Sunday, by going through what the resurrection means, talking about what it means to us, to the world, and what we see happening here in Mars Hill with Paul and the Athenian men and the philosophers. And I can't wait. Remember to invite your friends, remember to invite family and loved ones as we talk about the truth of the gospel next week. Have a tremendous opportunity for us to share that good news and also for you to continue on ministering to them. So I encourage you to do that in preparation for next week. Let's go to the Lord.